thing. And, um, and I, uh, climate change is at the heart of everything we do just because uh, basically it's manifesting through our water cycle and uh, our aging infrastructure and uh, centralized water systems are very much dependent on an old um, as the water cycle that we depended on for many years. And now we have to rethink everything that we do. So we work on this issue day in and day out sometimes calling it the impacts of climate change, sometimes focusing on all the other things that are uh, going wrong with our system due to climate change and other issues. Thank you, Dr. Ajami. Uh, Rob? Ujunishi Bimadasi, Rob Nijinikaz, going into Demosene, Philadelphia and Dunjaba, Anishinaabe Joaquin and Glyphwick and Danoki. My name is Rob Kroll. I'm the Climate Change Program Coordinator for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, I've been with Glyphwick for about three and a half years. Previous to that, I worked for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission as a conservation officer. Um, Glyphwick, uh, the simple description is that it's an intertribal natural resources agency, but uh, that's not the correct description. Um, Glyphwick exists because our 11 member Ojibwe tribes signed treaties with the United States government back in the mid 1800s. In all of these treaties, the tribes reserved for themselves their existing right to hunt, fish, and gather on the lands that they were ceding by force to the United States government. Um, once the individual states, Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin came into being, they began regulating uh, hunting and fishing, natural resources, and denied the rights that the tribal members had reserved from the, for themselves in the treaties. Um, over a century of prosecution and persecution um, proceeded, uh, with tribal members being arrested and sometimes jailed for practicing their rights and feeding their families on the lands that they had ceded to the U.S. Um, in the late 20th century, uh, a number of tribal members went out and got themselves arrested and then took these cases to court. And throughout the region, uh, it was reaffirmed that those rights still existed, uh, that the tribes um, had the right not only to um, continue to use public lands in the ceded territories for subsistence and ceremonial and medicinal purposes, uh, but they also had the right to regulate their own members, regulate their conduct, and to um, maintain the healthy ecosystems, uh, clean water, uh, healthy uh, non-human relatives, the natural resources that people depend on um, in perpetuity. Uh, for the next seven generations. Um, climate change affects all of this because climate change affects how and where and when people can practice their rights on the landscape. Um, Glyphwick got into the climate change business in about 2014. Uh, our program was created with the goal of integrating traditional ecological knowledge or that knowledge that people have carried with them down through generations specific to place um, with science to assess and adapt to the climate change that was already occurring um, uh, with the uh, acknowledgement that indigenous people who practice sub traditional subsistence lifestyles um, are one of the most disproportionately affected groups to, by climate change. With that, I will pass it to Kathy. Abuju, Nenawe Mangaladug, Wasa no de Kwe in the Jinakaz, Mayingan in the Dam, Anishinaabe Mede Kwe in the Wei Kwe Dung in Dunjuba. My given name is Kathleen Smith. You could also call me Kathy. I'm currently in a new position here at the Division of Biological Service with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission in Northern Wisconsin. And my title is actually an Ojibwe Mawin as the Ga Ganawang Dung Manomen 
which translates to she who takes care of the wild rice. Within this department here, I um, actually implement the Glyphwick Wild Rice Management Plan and work with the 11 tribes in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Wild rice is actually of great cultural significance to the member tribes that Rob speaks about. Um, we also focus on the preservation and enhancement of the Monoman beds in our ceded territory lakes. And I also provide expertise, public information, education outreach, and do presentations with in regards to Monoman and other things because I wear many hats as far as bringing in the culture and the traditions and ceremony. So we also make sure that you know our tribal members are able to ensure that their treaty rights are protected and exercised. So maybe you know with doing something along the actual work of going out and implementing the wild rice plan, we work with our local wild rice chiefs. We do survey work, which includes abundant surveys. So we have a MOU with the state of Wisconsin where we go out and we actually fly in an airplane and take pictures of various lake lakes and um, so because there's so many lakes and especially in the state of Wisconsin that um, it's too hard to really go out and do surveys of the Monoman beds and we also post it onto our Glyphic site so tribal and state harvesters can access that information. Um, climate change is ever-changing you know the ecosystems where the Monoman grows with intense rains from 2019 where it was flooding even within the Bad River Indian Reservation where Glyphwick is located, they had a flood here about that time. So it really compromised the Monoman beds. Um, to the drought conditions of this year, where over in Michigan, it was actually to the point to where, you know, we have um, native species plants that started coming back. Um, it's great competition you went with the Monoman beds, where in Minnesota, it actually had um, drought conditions to where the water levels dropped. And so getting to the rice beds were really hard with our you know, people that um, go out and harvest and they really sustain their way of life. And it's one of our major feast foods. We have four feast foods and Monoman wild rice is one of them. So we actually have, you know, make connections with um, the people if we have get questions because, you know, Food sovereignty is a big thing with our tribal nations and Monoman is one of them. And with that, you know, there's also in Wisconsin, we have brown spot disease where it implements, it, it really compromises the rice beds when you actually can see it in the abundant surveys. Um, it turns the whole bed brown. So then we can post that information onto our website and harvesters will be able to say, oh, this, this area is compromised brown, brown spot disease. It turns the whole rice bed brown. And it, uh, it's due to climate change. You know, there's a lot of moisture in the air where this disease comes. So with that, you know, it's just a lot of work that um, Glyphic helps other tribes. And, um, and it's just great work that we do. And thank you for having me and look forward to more conversation. Meet you. Thank you. Allie? Hi everyone, I'm Allie Davis and as Bailey said, I work for the State Department. I work in the Office of Conservation and Water on our water team. So my work is a little bit different, but it's, it's great to be here and hear the insight and the work that the other panelists are doing. So I'm, I am in transit, so I apologize if there's some background noise and I may eventually have to turn my video off. Um, my other caveat is the, the views I express today are, are solely my personal views and don't represent the State Department or the U.S. government necessarily. But I can give a little bit of a background of what my office does and our, how our work intersects with climate change. So as I mentioned before, I work on the water team and all of our work is governed by the U.S. Global Water Strategy that broadly aims to increase water security around the world by increasing access to safe sanitation, drinking water and hygiene, um, protect freshwater resources, promote transboundary water cooperation. And that actually might be the area where there's a little of overlap with the Great Lakes region. Um, and then the last piece is to strengthen institutions, governance, and finance. Um, obviously, as I believe Nusha said, um, 
water is critical and it's the place where climate change impacts are felt the greatest. So it's really hard to separate our work um, from climate change and that's always embedded throughout. Um, under the current administration, that's become even more explicitly recognized and implemented with raising ambition for climate action. Um, I think we also see a lot of changes in the ways that countries are interacting with one another over the water resources as, um, excuse me, this <laughs> announcement, but as um, there's changing rainfall patterns and unpredictability of water resources. So those are just some of the areas that we work on that relate to climate change. Thank you, Ali. So the work that you all do, you know, at the root, you're dealing with managing water resources, but you're doing so in very different ways. So Rob and Kathy, uh, Kathy you focus more on Midwestern issues, very local, regional issues. Nusha, you as well with Stanford Water in the West, but in a very different way, the West has a very different needs and resources than mid the Midwest does. And then Ellie, you're just really focusing broadly throughout the United States. How do you think that your work complements or impacts each other? And how do you ensure if your work is regional that it's getting national um, address station as well? I, I can go. Um, I think I would say um, a lot of the work that we do while it's under the umbrella of water in the West, we work actually nationally and internationally as well. And I think one thing I wanna mention which sort of feeds into what Kathleen and Rob were talking about is the fact that, you know, we have institutional and governance structures that are set in a different time without with a limited understanding of what is happening in the world and, and had serious unintended consequences, um, which now we are seeing it in so many different ways. Um, I think I, I, uh, as an observant to this system, I see so many Native Americans, even in California and the West, are being impacted in such a negative way, um, you know, from uh, the way we allocated water to different regions, the way that we transported water from its source to different place, uh, from contaminated um, water supplies. So there's, there's just so many different things we have done wrong, partly at the time because we didn't know or didn't have the knowledge um, that how what kind of consequences will be uh, will these decisions would have, but now we know and we can make better choices. And I think one one another piece of it is you know we engineered our way out of limitations that we had. For example, think about the Western U.S. We built this massive infrastructure system to move water from location to location. You know, I'm an engineer. I think it's magnificent to be able to build these things, but the reality is. We really didn't understand the uh, social, social and uh, um, ecosystem impacts of something like this, right? Now we do, right? So we actually took our way. So we thought we can conquer nature and make, make everything work. Now we have all these populations that depend on this massive system. And they basically have very limited understanding of what does it take to bring the water to them? Half of them don't even know where their water is coming from, where it goes. And fascinating enough, when you go to uh, sort of like underrepresented communities or some of the uh, sort of um, conventional or actually uh, valuable uh, knowledge that native communities bring to the table, you actually learn that, okay, you know, you have to live with nature, you have to work with nature, nature should be at the heart of everything that you do. And we all are trying to make that happen, but the problem is you have such outdated institutional and governance structures that make that transition very difficult. And also financial systems. I think Ali touched on that. We still fund and finance projects that are easy to measure outcome from. You know, it's very easy to say, okay, you know, if I build this massive system, it brings this much water to people. And um, we can say it with confidence, uh, even though that confidence is built on a very shaky legs because, uh, you know, climate change is impacting everything in a system. But it's easy, right? But when you're dealing with nature, you're dealing with uncertainty, you're dealing with um, change, variation, which is not as easy to measure sometimes. And it is quite hard to put a very specific number to it. So um, learning how to invest in solutions that are nature focused, human focused, and it's basically thinks about um, 
equity and access at the central part of it, rather than just talking about that, actually trying to figure that out or creating solution that has multi benefits. Um, that's going to be the path forward. Solutions that are nature based um, and values nature, works with nature, rather than sort of putting it aside and trying to conquer it. Uh, however, we really need to go again, go back and revisit our uh, water rights system, governance structure, financing models, and uh, structural systems that we have that is that has led to what we have right now, and see how we can change them. Otherwise, everything that we do is just a band aid. Band aid that's not going to really solve the actual problem. It's just moving it to the next generation to deal with. I guess I can jump in next. Um, just a couple of things. I mean, Glyphwick is essentially a regional organization and a lot of our work is done on that level. Um, but we do assist our member tribes in consultation with the US government and with the individual state governments. Um, so that's, that's one arena where we work on a national level uh, at times. Um, and one of those govern, uh, governmental structures and, and um, processes that Nusha was talking about that's outdated and, and isn't, um, isn't reflective of the sovereign status of tribal nations in the United States. Um, there are plenty of statutes that require consultation uh, when projects are being proposed or developed in areas that affect uh, native people. Um, but consultation isn't consent. And uh, projects have been forced upon these communities for hundreds of years. Um, and they're left dealing with the environmental results of it. Uh, and also on the fragmentation and dissolution in their culture that these projects sometimes cause. Um, another level we deal with is we work with tribal communities across the United States, in Canada, in Mexico, to help them adapt to climate change. Uh, Glyphwick was one of the co-authors of a adaptation menu that was created back in 2019 called the Bug and Jigadeg Anishinaabe Asia Twad, a tribal climate adaptation menu, which is really, we hope, a blueprint for um, non-tribal entities that work with tribal communities to help them approach communities from a, a better perspective, um, a perspective that um, helps them kind of understand that things don't necessarily work the same way in, in uh, native communities as they do in, in sort of mainstream society. Um, and then the biggest point in that, I'm gonna like let Kathy take over from here, is that all of these projects and products and structures need to be sold at the local level. Otherwise, they don't work. And I'll talk about, you know, the importance of making those tribal connections, you know, between tribal communities, tribal governments throughout our ceded territories. So we have four different, you know, treaties, which is 1836, 1837, 1842, and 1854, which are spread out through Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Um, so within, you know, the United States Constitution, the treaties are re redefined as supreme law of the land here. Um, treaties are legally binding agreements made between our nations. You know, today the rights are kept by the Ojibwe people to hunt, fish, and gather on our land, even land that is sold. So with that, you know, I'll bounce a little bit more off of Rob, which is a good introduction to, you know, we always must ask permission. Asking permission, you know, we always have to find the protocols of how to ask that permission, you know, for these teachings, the cultures, the consultations, and being able to speak for Ojibwe people, indigenous communities. So that's very important to establish. And it's all, all about building these relationships, even with our own research. And we are always asked, you know, to be consults to, um, 
to local universities, um, the state, on the federal level. So with that, we always try to engage community by most of all, you know, getting to know them, getting down on the ground and actually, you know, make setting up meetings and building these relationships. Because if you don't have that, there's no way that your research can go forward. And I could give you one example, you know, because there's always these um, barriers that need to be broken down because there's a cultural difference. And most of all, if you ask permission and get to know people, that wall will actually come down. And that's what I find, you know, working on both sides that, you know, there's a hesitancy with working with each other. And, and it's just the not knowing, not knowing the culture, not knowing the teachings. And you'd be surprised when you do ask permission and start building these relationships, how open people really are. And I find that communities, you know, with engaging with them, building those relationships and most of all that trust. I have myself as experienced, you know, in my own community where I'm from, Cuna Bay Indian community, that um, where research had, had came into the community, conducted their research, and their obligations were not followed through. So it really kind of put me in an awkward, awkward situation to where I had to approach these researchers and that one researcher that actually had did the, the research in our community was no longer with us. He had walked on. And I had to approach his son, that was a part of it, and ask him, where is our, our samples that was, were taken from our community members? Our elders have been asking, well, what happened to that report? We never heard back. And this was before my time, you know, coming back to the Schnabig homelands. So also, you know, with that, there has to be that communication. There also has to be that follow through of the report. So eventually that report was presented to the community. I found out what happened to our samples. And so it's that it's very important to continue building those relationships and make sure you follow through with your findings. And especially the communities that you approach and that you work with. So I'll end that right there, which. I, I love that the theme from hearing the other three panelists talk was that stakeholder engagement and really the meaningful sense of that and the local context. Um, I think my work is a little bit of a different approach to that, but those two themes are absolutely fundamental to the work that we do on water internationally and especially in the transboundary water context. Um, I, I think we see that happen when we engage with Canada and Mexico through the International Joint Commission and the International Boundary Waters Commission, respectively. Um, and there's, there's a whole myriad of stakeholders in both of those contexts that it has not always happened correctly or perfectly, um, but I think that through decades of history, um, there's been a lot of work to move the ball forward on improving the way that stakeholder engagement and local context are informing water management decisions and infrastructure management and nature-based solutions in those contexts. Um, I, I think the other thing that's interesting to me about the question of how does international work um, relate to the national and the local and we see all the time um, stakeholders from across across the globe in water ministries or ministries of the environment or water utilities who are really interested in hearing about the United States ex experience with water. And I think Nusha mentioned a really great example of the Colorado River in the West being a really complex and often over-engineered approach to water management, but I think it's also demonstrated a lot of the challenges and struggles that other communities and countries have with their water resources and so i think i think the united states has a really great example to share a lot of work to do as well but a, an example to share of how different communities and stakeholders and really different levels of government have worked together um, to try to strengthen our own water security and how it relates to food and energy and agriculture and things like that um, and that example has been 
I think really valuable in our international work to to build trust and to demonstrate to partners that we have experience and we have challenges and we have lessons learned from both and that can be really valuable to build a cooperative um, mindset as well. Go ahead. Bailey, can I, okay, I just wanted to add this. I think Ali mentioned this and I think following on to what Rob and Kathleen said, Look, I think there are two levels to this. One is how you're transferring your knowledge and experience to other locations because everybody wants to build the same thing that we did 100 years ago. They think this is the path to success, economic growth, social success. And one of the things we are constantly focusing on is, look, these communities have a chance to leapfrog our negative experiences. Uh, similar to how we went, some communities went from um, landline phone to mobile phones directly and never had to do that in between. Um, I know it's a, obviously water is a very precious resource, but I think it's a very similar example because we are actually, there are communities that right now are in a path of doing exactly all to make all the same mistakes we made in the past and actually lose their indigenous values and uh, practices around water. So that's where internationally we have to be a lot more active to make sure we don't fund and finance uh, systems that can have such unintended consequences in the future. I think on this other side with the existing problems we have in, in, in the US, I think one big problem is we have set up these systems, the stakeholder engagement systems that are very much dependent on the sort of how much money you have to get involved. And um, I, get, I give you an example from my personal experience. I was involved in a study that was focused on a lake in California. I'm not going to name it. Uh, but, you know, there was a significant involvement from the ind indigenous community because they were really dealing with the brunt of the consequences of whatever had happened like 50, 100 years ago. Um, the problem was, the other side of the coin, they had all the staffing, all the sophistication that you can imagine to bring us pages and pages and documents uh, that showed that how whatever all the studies that they have done and all the money they have put into this, um, how it has, you know, would lead to a different outcome. And on the indigenous side, you know, you have people who are dealing with daily struggles of uh, surviving on land uh, that's compromised. And their only capacity to engage in this process was a letter that was written by one of the chiefs that was involved in, the com in that community, which from an academic side, you know, you're like, oh, we can't really use this one letter in this process. But we have to sit back and say, yes, but are these people with the same capacity? Do they, can they bring the same sophistication to the table? Are we really giving the same weight to their voice versus somebody who has all the consultants in the world? So I think the level of engagement is also very important and how, how what's the fighting capacity or um, by different communities as they come to the table. Just having a seat at the table is not enough. That's a really good point that you bring up and um, kind of congruent with the topic earlier you mentioned of how important keeping nature um, first is at the heart of everything you do in water resource management. And I, I guess that kind of leads into how, how do you help encourage policymakers and scientists and build a culture of keeping nature at the heart of what we do rather than corporate strategies or who has the most money? Um, what, what methods are you employing to ensure that we're shifting towards this different strategy? And this is open to uh, any of the panelists. So I guess uh, one of the things that's kind of important to recognize, Nusha's talked about it, Ali's talked about it, um, is the incorporation of indigenous knowledge into policymaking. Um, Glyphwick has been active with the International Joint Commission. Uh, they're currently doing a pilot project and a study on how to integrate uh, indigenous knowledge specific to the place 
uh, the Great Lakes and the surrounding watersheds um, into the policy work that they do. Um, there are a number of other regional, national, international organizations that are trying to do the same thing. Um, but it's important to recognize that this knowledge, this information that they're seeking to use is specific to and belongs to the indigenous people uh, who've developed it over since, you know, millennia, since time immemorial. Um, it's our, our, again, our governance structures and statutes, our intellectual property laws don't really reflect um, tribal cultural knowledge. Um, you know, probably the thing that comes the closest is the United Nations uh, free prior and informed consent requirements um, that really uh, force people who want this knowledge to recognize that this information belongs to the people, uh, the indigenous people who developed it, um, and that they really need to be advised of what it's going to be used for and that their permissions required throughout. And if they rescind that permission, the other parties involved need to respect that. And I'll add on with um, Rob, you know, in our way, we always first acknowledge Mama Aki, Mother Earth, and our precious Nibi, because that's what actually connects us all. No matter what work that we do, you know, harvesting foods off the land, foraging, um, but what we do is we try to make it community exclusive and try to incorporate ways to include everybody. Because even from the community that I'm from, from Huna Bay Indian community in Upper Peninsula of Michigan, some of this work we wouldn't be able to do on our own. As in the Shinaabeg, you know, we don't all have that knowledge, even the biological side. And I find that with the knowledge that I have, there's no degree for it. There's no way that we can prove, you know, certain knowledge keepers, you know, to give them a certificate. Because there's even some meetings where in Monoman, okay, we talk about wild rice beds. And we have the muskrat that are disappearing. And they say once they disappear, then our rice will disappear. So there's so many other teachings that, you know, go on hand in hand. But how do you prove that? First, it has to be proven by science first in order to, for it to have integrity. When all along we've had the knowledge as indigenous people, but it has to be proven by the science community. And so with Rob's work, he, that's what we deal with is a lot with traditional ecological knowledge to get that um, knowledge recognized. And it's a hard thing to do. But, you know, we have to wait for science to, to catch up to us, to that knowledge that we already do have. And that's why it's important for us to work together, you know, and to seek out those knowledge keepers. We must always first give that asima, that tobacco, and ask permission to speak with them or to share their knowledge. So if we keep it down to the point to where, you know, it's the simple things that I have learned being in the biological side of it, and also in the traditional side of it. So it's like I have a foot in both worlds and have that understanding to the point to where the knowledge that I do keep, I share it with a lot of people. And hopefully it will plant seeds in a way, especially with the science world, for them to have this understanding of the land connections, especially with our precious Nibi, and to do our work together. And it's to the point to where we have water walks, which I can get into a little bit more later on, to where I incorporate it with all community members. It's just not an Anishinaabeg because how else is everybody else gonna learn those connections? They already have them. I just have to gently remind them in that way. So with that, you know, it's, it's important to, to be inclusive of all because there's no way that our Anishinaabeg people can do this work without research behind it at this time, me which. One thing I wanted to, to add on to this discussion is um, I think both the incorporation of indigenous and local and traditional knowledge 
and the incorporation of other forms of scientific information and input is um, something that I think has been growing, maybe despite what you might see from the media, but growing um, within the State Department on the work and the policies that we we do related to water and especially related to biodiversity. And um, there's one thing that, one example I just wanted to give with, I I work on the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And that's a platform that provides scientific assessments related to, um, related to biodiversity, water, natural resources and what governments can do to improve the work that we're doing on the policy side there. But there have been a lot of efforts in that body to incorporate and include more fulsomely indigenous and local knowledge and consider the roles that that has in the scientific community and not just adjacent to. Um, and, and as a whole, those assessments are really useful in the way that we make decisions about international policies or, or country and regional initiatives because they provide a, a strong foundation um, and an increase in information that can help inform those decisions. I, I just want to say I think everybody sort of covered what was important in this so I'm going to uh, let you ask the next question and not take more time in the air. Sounds good, thank you. So uh, we only have a few minutes left, um, but I'm curious, we have a pretty broad um, group of individuals here for the symposium. Do you have any specific advice for early career scientists? Anything you'd like to plug that involves working in water and natural resource policy, how they can get involved locally and beyond? I can, I can go first, if you don't mind. I, I think a couple of things. Uh, look, universities are moving sort of towards this impact-driven research slowly, but they're sort of realizing they have to do science in the service of society rather than just for the sake of science. And I don't mean that we should not just pursue science for its sake. I think that's extremely important, but there needs to be more capacity created for engagement. And I think that's what Kathy mentioned and Rob mentioned as well, which is having people at these organizations who actually not just connecting people to, for example, tribal communities, but actually doing that, not a, beyond connection, going to actually doing the research, doing, uh, making sure the que right questions are asked, making sure this engagement is real rather than just I come to your community, give me all your data. I'm gonna go do my research, I'll publish my paper, and then I'm gonna move on. And then my, my argument would be, look, I did it all, you know, I did engage, but that's not engagement. Engagement is as you go move step-by-step step through the research, you constantly go back and reevaluate your um, questions, your assumptions, your, uh, knowledge that you're bringing to the table and make sure everybody's involved in that process. Um, on a personal side, I'll tell you, I took a class when I was doing my master's degree at the University of Arizona on water policy. Uh, I'm an engineer, I have a number of engineering degrees. That class was the most illuminating class I've ever taken in my entire educational uh, process because it actually illuminated to me that doesn't matter how sophisticated of a model I build, unless I really understand the laws and the policies that are in place, I can never ever build a solution that can be impactful. We have to actually, again, revisit how we govern our water systems and make sure it's all inclusive. Otherwise, we are, we are just solving just marginal problems. And I, I think that's good but it's never going to have that broader impact that we want when it comes to equity and justice and access. Um, because these, these laws, and as again, uh, laws and systems are laws put in place in the 19th century. We have infrastructure system from the 20th century, and we have 21st century problems that we have to deal with. And none of those are equipped to help us move forward. And one last thing I would say is, um, 
the way we do economics also needs to be revisited. We constantly think about short-term benefits over long-term sustainability, and that equation needs to be switched. And that actually is something academics and future students can actually push forward on. Uh, we can't be, we can't have a sustainable water system if we are doing it. Uh, we are constantly valuing things on a dollar sign of how much benefits or profits that thing can create for us in the short term. We have to have a long-term vision. And that's where the indigenous knowledge comes into play because they had to survive generation after generation. Again, I'm, I, I'm not, I don't belong to those communities. I'm not uh, claiming that I speak for them. And I think Kathy and Rob can speak to that. But I think that's why you can actually preserve the land and resources for many generations rather than within 100 years get to the bottom of it and just look back and say, so what happened? Why isn't this thing working? So I think it's very, very important to have that acknowledgement. I can add just two thoughts and maybe a piece of advice um, on that question as well. And to me, I think the way that we can be even more impactful in the water sector and in adapting and building resilience to climate change, I think really does come down to the more that we're able to grow and, in, and diversify the people and communities that we're engaging with and the people who are leading that engagement and the more that we're able to, to view these problems as systems that require holistic solutions, I think the better we will all be for taking those approaches. Um, if there are people in the audience who are either on the younger, starting their career side or interested in working on water issues, um, what has worked for me in getting into that space is maybe a similar answer to my previous is diversifying who I'm talking to trying to collect a bunch of different perspectives on how they've worked on water, what they've learned, the challenges they see, and that's been really helpful in my career. And also, I would like to speak about how I actually work with one university in the UP of Michigan. I actually work with Michigan Technological University with their Indigenous Peoples Day campaign. And the work that I do there is we have um, a local water walk. So we were approached um, by that community to utilize our Anishinaabe protocol. And it's a way of bringing our communities together and bring awareness for our most precious gift, maybe the water. I remember living out west in California as the water walk, you know, with grandmother Josephine from this local community where our lodge is. She had been doing numerous water walks going cross country. She would start from the west coast and had another start from the east, another from the south, another from the north, and they would all meet in the middle. She did two of those. And I did share a link, I think, when I did send in some um, websites. So she did a lot of water walks that, that really moved my heart. Because then when I started coming back home to Anishinaabeg homeland, I got to meet her. Didn't realize she was attending the same lodge that I was a part of. And Bidasage is no longer with us. But, you know, bringing the water walks to these communities to where it actually started a movement. And it started out as a joke you know, with the grandmothers that kind of sat, they were drinking coffee, eating cookies. And it, they were challenged by the Grand Chief, Eddie Benton at the time, and he's also no longer with us. And that's where a lot of our teachings come from, was from his grandmother. And they were sitting around, they were kind of joking because he said, water is gonna be just as expensive as a gallon of gasoline more than its weight in gold eventually. What are you gonna do about it? So it starts at that, that one little question, what are you gonna do about it? And so that's how the water walk movement began. And now it's known throughout our region using the Anishinaabe Kwe protocol. And we always have to have the males because we always have to have the balance of the masculine and the feminine. 
So what you could do is become parts of it by finding out where are these panels? How do we get involved? Even within your own community, you could do your own events to bring that awareness for our precious DB. And with that, you know, the water walk, I, mean, I facilitate two per year. And it went from a core group of seven to over 70 people that attended. And we opened it up to Michigan Tech and the surrounding community. Because at first there were people were stopping us and asking, what is this, a parade? <laughs> to now there's they are giving us, you know, the fists, a thumbs up, and they're actually donating, you know, to contribute to the water walks. And so there's more awareness, you know, within the communities that are coming about to where, you know, we are all inclusive because we can't do this work on our own. And more people are turning to indigenous communities. And this is one of our prophecies. We're gonna to come to a fork in the road to where we're gonna look upon indigenous people for this knowledge. So I just wanted to say that much is to get involved at the community level within your own community. Even if it's you making that step forward to do something about it and hold an education outreach and bring in awareness, miigwech. Thank you so much. Would you like to add anything, Rob? I mean, give me the opportunity for the last word, huh? <laughs> um, I guess just to touch on what Kathleen said about um, particularly those of us who are uh, non-native and working in tribal communities. Um, it's very important if any of uh, the folks here on the webinar today are considering working in tribal communities to go in realizing that there are going to be times in your career when you're going to feel uncomfortable, particularly when you need to step back and let the community lead you. Uh, you've invested a lot of years and a lot of money in your education. Um, and that's great. But to really work in the community, uh, you do need to open up. You need to put yourself out there. Sometimes that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, and be prepared sometimes to feel uncomfortable. And you know what? That's okay. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists so much for this discussion. This has been really insightful and a great opportunity to hear some voices in the water management community that we don't normally get to hear from. So I would like to just announce that following this panel,